This video is sponsored by Surfshark. Hello, and welcome to the Hardman Good Times Broadcast. My name is Butch Dieselsteak, and today we're going to be talking about self-improvement for young men. Have you been feeling kind of down recently? Yeah. Well, that must mean you're not a man. When's the last time you consumed four raw eggs? Have you ever invested in crypto? Or are you not brave enough? When's the last time you flipped a tire over? When's the last time you ate yourself into a week-long meat coma? Okay, what are we gonna do with the meat? I, I don't know. Well, what do you think can be done about it? Fund social programs to help young adults find hobbies and socialize with each other and more support for young men suffering with mental health issues. <laughs> It's the feminists! It's the cultural Marxists! Now the femoids have got their own little jobs gluing acrylic nails to horses or something. They only want to date the wealthy Chad. There are microplastics in your sperm. You're never gonna touch a woman. Your skull is the wrong shape and your balls are not tanned like Tucker Carlson's. You will forever be maidenless. Just drink the soy milk, Jeremy. Just grow your soy boobs and accept Except no bitches. No bitches. No bitches. No bitches. Is the hard to collapse and set the levels to the ground. Man, how are we gonna do with those men? Hello. Woman here. Guys, gals, and NBs, I've got some news. Someone found the rotten corpse of Gamergate, ripped it out of its shallow grave, and is letting the maggots slowly crawl out of it for hours upon hours, propped up in front of a Shaw SM7B mic. Straight men are having a crisis. If you'd like to have a laugh and an aneurysm at the same time, I suggest you check out the Incel Wiki to read up on some theory. There, you can enjoy reading up on peer-reviewed concepts such as female sneakiness. They've even provided us with a picture of Eve with bare boobs eating the apple even if told not to. And you can click on the word boobs there if you're not sure what those are. They even provide helpful citations, such as the music video for No Scrubs by TLC to demonstrate hypergamy. Even though their ideology is much the same as incels, the front-facing influencers of the Manosphere won't call themselves incels because the incels are their customers. These alpha males, in fact, used to be just like you, but now they are the ones who have made it to the sex haver citadel, the top 1% of males who have hacked the female brain and fitness game, and they're there to teach you, young Chadawan, how you can get there too. You don't need to be six foot seven, have a jawline that could cut glass or inject cooking oil into your biceps. You just have to take the red pill. The current zeitgeist of the red pill are Tweedle P and Tweedle Cum of the Fresh and Fit podcast, with Fresh and his little CEO bling chain that looks like it came from an incel subsidiary of Claire's Accessories, and Myron Gaines, a guy who literally named himself Admiring Gaines. Hold in your puke, we've only just started. The Fresh and Fit podcast serves as a marketing vehicle for Rollo Tomasi and his successful book and blog, The Rational Male, which spells out red pill theory with a supposed scientific backing. He's supposed to be a modern dating expert, but he's been married for 25 years to a woman who I assume is extremely adept at compartmentalizing, as I couldn't imagine having a husband who's drawn a sexual market value graph, especially one that starts at age 15. Rollo calls himself the godfather of the red pill, but I think he looks more like the incel crypt keeper. The one who's Riddles 3 you must pass to enter the sweaty basement of the manosphere. <coughs> Unfortunately, there's not enough BuzzFeed videos going around these days of extremely cringe radfems for angry meninists to rack up millions of views by providing their extremely insightful commentary on them. Why are women perceived as the weaker sex? 
Probably because statistically speaking, see, if you understand what humor is and how it works, than men, which I'm guessing you women, don't because you're feminist, women, women, the start of they know that the things that are not as funny as men, generally speaking, 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 are not as funny reparations. But now certain YouTube channels have learned that you can spike unsuspecting young men who are simply looking for self-improvement advice with a cheeky red pill via the algorithm, such as this one which uploads videos titled things like The Ultimate Guide for Young Men How to Get Your Life Together or Nine Strange Ways to Boost Your Confidence and soon enough you'll have fallen into titles like Toxic Masculinity is a Myth and Why 95% of Men are Single and Lonely and The Danger of Celibacy or How Women Manipulate You. This channel in particular has become extremely popular even though it's just stock footage with a computer generated voiceover reading a script that sounds like it was written by an AI whose only data input source is the diary of a 15 year old boy who got rejected by the popular girl in class one time and has constructed his entire personality around it. One, if you're unattractive, then don't ever try to flirt or even approach us. Whatever you'll do will automatically be considered creepy to us. Each word you say makes us puke. Poor people mostly lack self-confidence and also, many poor guys are desperate to get girls. Being rich makes you valuable. Women love it when they get attention from someone who is valuable in society. It's every girl's fantasy. Remember Fifty Shades of Grey. Yes, their favorite media to reference when applying generic armchair psychology to all women is the movie Fifty Shades of Grey, of course, because that book was written by all women. It was actually me who wrote the line, I feel the color in my cheeks rising again. I must be the color of the communist manifesto. Nothing turns me on more than Marx. I'll take the knee for you, Carl. Um, we also all wrote B-Movie. Did you know that all women want is a man with a furry little butt? She wants a little tiny furry man with wings that she can trap under a glass whenever she wants. And also, you're never going to fulfill those unattainable body standards because you're a big loser non-bee human without a bee sting and each word you say makes her puke and also, this is every girl's fantasy. Remember B-Movie. But hang on one minute. How will you ever be able to learn what a woman really wants by watching B-Movie if it's not available on US Netflix? Well, my friends, do I have something that could help you with that? That's right, this video is sponsored by Surfshark. Surfshark will allow you to switch to over 3,200 different servers to be able to view Netflix from other streaming services from whichever country you like. It also keeps your online identity safe by encrypting all of the information you send from an unlimited number of devices to the internet. There's also a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk to just give it a go. But not only that, Surfshark is also giving away their antivirus for free during the month of June. By using my download link in the description and using the code MOONCAT, you can get 83% off and three months extra for free. Once again, that's the code MOONCAT and you can get 83% percent off and three months extra for free. So like most of these red pill roofie channels, Myron will give dating advice that seems pretty normal to begin with, if a little invasive, such as how to pick up women at the gym. Life tip, if you do so much as even try to get me to take out one AirPod while I'm in the middle of a workout, you're getting a kettlebell right up in the scrot. So you want to talk to women at other gyms where there's not going to be that much of a social consequence. You're going to say something along the lines of, hey, I'm new to this gym. I don't come often. I just want to uh, meet you real quick. If a guy shows no interest and I've seen him work out, like, you know, you kind of know regulars, but you don't know them. Like, but you see him work out like, oh yeah, I know this guy because he shows up at the same time I show up. Mm -hmm. And then he finally makes conversation. I'm more willing to talk to that guy versus as like someone who is like staring at me and then tries to talk to me, I'd be like, okay, okay. leave me alone. Myron, you had editorial control here. You could have cut that bit out. You know, the bit where she completely destroyed all of the advice you gave. But don't forget to sign up for his free dating and fitness advice ebook. 
make sure to get my free ebook. I'm gonna share content with you guys that I otherwise probably wouldn't be able to share on YouTube or Instagram because it's not safe. Well, I've been on Myron's email list for a couple of months now, and I am yet to receive these hot tips and tricks that wouldn't be allowed on YouTube. He says that they wouldn't be allowed on YouTube, but he links to videos that are hosted on YouTube. Myron hits all of the usual scammy sales funnel tactics. Sob story about getting bullied in school, fake secondhand testimonials from Scott and Giuseppe, a story where Myron himself saved up for ages on a minimum wage job so he could pay $6,000 to his mentor and how much that changed his life so you are softened up to the idea of paying him $250 for a 10 minute call, $500 for a 30 minute call or $897 for a one hour call. Myron says in his ebook that after unplugging from the matrix and realizing what women want for himself, they became attracted to him like bees to honey, bees to honey, bees to honey, bees to honey. He says bees to honey four times in this ebook. I'm starting to think he finds bees sexually attractive now. Also, this analogy doesn't even make any sense. Bees aren't sexually attracted to honey. Bees make honey. Unless you mean that your workout regimen caused a swarm of women to consume various plant secretions which they then regurgitated and using the resulting viscous substance sculpted you into existence and stored you to consume over the next several years as a non-perishable food source, because if so, that's pretty impressive. So what's this information then that Myron's been hiding from us that's too hot for YouTube? In an email called Fitness Industry Lied to You, Truth Revealed, we get to the truth about losing weight. I bet you're all dying to know. I filmed an entire YouTube video for you on this exact thing. Check it out here, breaking down the truth on fat loss. These truths are often seen as controversial, so this video could be taken down at any time. <gasps> We'd better click on the link now. What are these controversial secrets, Myron? So for weight loss to occur, guys, calories out needs to exceed calories in. <gasps> Holy shit! This is Susan, what are you doing leaving this up? We can't have this on YouTube. So what about Fresh? Well, he's an expert alpha, banging nines and tens all the time too, don't you know? Sometimes three in a day. But today we're gonna talk about my W in terms of having three women in one day. Now, it sounds crazy, right? I met this guy at a pool party. He's an NBA player. I won't say his name for, for some reasons, but you know, he's a pretty top tier guy, head value guy, right? So he's like, yo, dude, you know what? I'm having a mansion party like uh, the next day. Come through, I got you. Legit, guys. I could have a threesome with them. Did my thing with one of them. Came back outside, hopped in the shower real quick, talked to the other one, went back in the room later on. So basically, I had three girls in one night. First rule of the caravan club is that everyone gets some. He then uses this 100% very true story to sell his DMs on demand course for Instagram dating. Plus, it's only $1,000 for a one hour Instagram dating consultation call, after which you could have women react like this to your Instagram too. No, 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 be honest. I don't really care. Be honest. Be, be honest. Okay. Why? I think I'm almost like, I feel bigger than you. Loki kind of looks like a new fraud in a way. Right? Right? <laughs> I'm a Nigerian scammer. Uh, Yo, I sweat everything. That was what I was going to say next. Yeah. You look Nigerian. Yeah, that's yeah. And like, I would think you scam. I'm going to pass because you look like the off brand Kevin Hart. Okay, no, put up my rinse. No, hell no. Yes. We're, no. True alpha males. I have no idea why you'd go to Twitter for dating advice, but there's even Twitter accounts that offer seduction tips. And just so it sounds like they know what they're talking about, like it has a basis in actual female psychology or something, they sprinkle the red pill bullshit in there to make it sound as if it's scientific, like these are guaranteed seduction techniques based on peer-reviewed research that will work on any woman. There is always an ad for a course underneath these tweets and if you click on the course link the seduction devil wants to sell you you'll apparently be doing the following in just one week skipping the line at bars and clubs high-fiving the bouncers and befriending the staff friends shocked staring at them in disbelief 
attracting nines and tens effortlessly without saying a word to them, entering a cafe with their girl, receiving a warm welcome and discovering that their regular has already been prepared, walking into any social setting for the first time and leaving happier, smarter and richer having made meaningful connections. Beautiful women dropping every excuse to be around them, shooting DMs even when she's got nothing to say, finding time for them when she's busy for everyone else. And women will bring you sandwiches with chips, braless, not asked for, right after you've got a double kill bot lane on League of Legends. It's a tried and tested grifting technique of gradually convincing men that they can externalize their self-confidence and masculinity issues and solely place the blame on women. A simple enemy is always more enticing than the complex and nuanced issues of late stage capitalism and the social stigmas of male mental health. Women, sadly, are an easy target. Once they hate women, they no longer treat the women in their lives as equals. And then when the women are not responsive to their supposedly scientifically proven game techniques or are unwilling to be subservient wives, they will hate them even more, blame feminism and a woke society, and possibly regress into inceldom and or other alt-right pipelines. This keeps them in the grips of the manosphere for as long as possible, paying for courses and watching the content in a paradoxical mental state of both hating women and being obsessed with them, wanting to talk about them for hours on end, day after day. And this is what made it so difficult for me to try and curate all of the main talking points of the Manosphere into a simple set of teachings. The space is full of like 90 minute podcasts, during which they just gargle each other's Kool-Aid, regurgitating the same ideas over and over again. And here I am, worried about the runtime of this video like a beta little cook. Ooh, will anyone watch my video if it's 90 minutes long? It took me three months to make, but I don't know if anyone will be interested. Meanwhile, in the Manosphere... What's up? Welcome to the 9,700... 25th episode of Roids Before Foids, and today we're going to be spending the next three hours talking about whether it's gay to talk to women. But I've investigated enough scams at this point to know that if you need to convince people of an idea that initially sounds absurd, your best bet is to lock them in a room for as long as possible and to repeat the same ideas to them over and over again until they start to sound plausible. And this will happen until these men are so blackpilled that they've fallen down the rabbit hole onto the Wheat Waffles face rating charts and are desperately trying to work out how ugly women find them with needlepoint precision. So the skull can be divided into two parts, the splanchocranium, which comprises all of the facial features, and the neurocranium. But a few years ago, this Kermit sounding ass PhD haver crawled onto the scene and started regurgitating these ideas, but with bigger words, emboldening the movement even beyond the damp basements of inceldom and into popular right wing rhetoric. This man is Cthulhu, inserting his slimy tentacles into every video I make now, and each time he does, I realise more and more how dangerous he is. Fresh and Fit came along and took the podcast format, but instead of shouting the talking points in other men's faces, they will invite unprepared women on as guests under the guise of discussing sex and relationships, and then when they get there, they take their phones off them, not the male guests, make them sign a waiver, and then feed them shots until they can no longer form a coherent sentence. I, on the other hand, need to drink to perform a coherent sentence. <laughs> when you come home, I'm gonna be in lingerie. I'm gonna keep it nice and fresh and waxed for you. I'm gonna cook your food. Oh, you just shit. gotta bring home the bacon. That's oh, it. Shit. But as soon as a woman disagrees with Myron, he will kick her off for interrupting him. She's big and beautiful, except for how she is. Essentially, I big girl. can you please stop interjecting? Sorry. Do not ever fucking snap your fingers at me again. You're gonna respect me on my platform, and period. And you're gonna respect me backwards. No, 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 no. You're gonna keep being disrespectful. It is. All right, get the fuck out. No problem. Real talk, get out. 
All right, go ahead. Oh, take your headphones, get out. Let's take several seats, serious. guys. It's okay. I'm dead ass. Like, get the fuck out of here, bro. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna tolerate no chick I'm not here thinking like, oh, I'm special, but I don't know. It's like, you can walk out now. He's not in his feelings, though, like a woman. No, it's not an emotional female reaction. No, it's a fact reaction. No, you just got like super mad. No, 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 no. It's rude to cut people off. Yeah, yeah, bye. Yeah, oh, yeah, oh, Goodbye. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, bye. You gotta respect the platform and not cut people off. That's yeah, an that's emotional cool. reaction. No, listen, it's a fact reaction. But this isn't surprising, really, when he literally thinks women should be silent. Okay, I'm gonna offend some people, so I can't wait for them to queue up the how dare you sign. Women are to be seen, not heard, bro. How dare you? You know what I'm saying? I'm, especially if I bring you to a function, shut up and don't speak unless people speak to you. Are you triggered, Myron? Each episode goes a little bit like this. There's more and more single mothers with mental disorders and all of their kids are criminals and it's all feminism's fault, guys. I'm sorry, it's not because of the wage Why gap. Why did you guys feed me so many shots because the I wage gap him. is a myth it's all down to women's choice to earn less and grape culture is also a myth okay we have the studies and the stats to prove it it's all there it's just a facts, fact facts. i'm sorry i'm sorry if you can't deal with it because you're in your feelings because you're a female but that's just the way it is it is what it is i totally agree see she gets it we love it when a female tells the truth on the fresh and fit podcast <laughs> I don't think what he's saying is right. I mean, why not? It's the facts. It is what it is. Are you just in your feelings? Yes. <laughs> She's in her feelings. No, it's it's because. Don't interrupt me. And another thing. Did you know girls only have two holes? Yeah. The third one is just a myth. Facts, the females facts. say that there's a third one down there just for attention. <laughs> we have the studies to back it up linked in the description. All right. And I am definitely not relying on the fact that none of you are actually going to look at those studies and read them from start to finish and question the validity of the sources. Facts, facts. I'll give you another chance. Continue. Oh, I think the wage gap actually exists because... The facts are that females can actually pee all of their period blood out at once. Okay. But facts, they don't facts. for attention. They're all in their feelings like oh this Bye. hurts if you just like sat down on the toilet and squeezed your womb for a second i know that it's all over and done with in like a minute i think he has a point this girl can come back she's the only one here telling the truth well i was gonna say i think the wage gap exists stop because... interrupting me that's strike two get out Wait, you weren't Leave. even talking before i call the police well well i was gonna say get out how dare Sign you? Sign up for my OnlyFans. Get out. It's five dollars. Okay, a month. Could have made it more money. Ever since but females have been divorced, and I don't know. Earning more than men, facts. they're now divorcing them and taking all of their money, myself, and they're actually so naturally more subservient. And men facts. should be able to decide who to sleep with and not the women. It is what it is. Women Are you just in your feelings. Myron takes all of his talking points from Rollo to Massey, who, as far as I can tell, is a failed musician with zero qualifications in anything, never mind the field of evolutionary psychology, which he seems to extensively use to back up his theories in the rational male. I said this in book four, you can remove the, 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 you can remove the human from the tribe, but you can't remove the tribe from the human. You can remove the, the, uh, the, what is it? You can, tr you can still, well, like, what was the other question I just got? It was, uh, you can, can, can women, uh, not be solipsistic. Can we train them and to teach them to to temper that and control? Yeah, we can. But you can't remove that. It's still there. It's still an influence. Much of the red pill is based on pop evolutionary psychology, which is a widely criticized field of psychology in general. It is impossible to conduct studies on Evo Psych without forcing a set of humans to grow up in a life devoid of any societal stimuli. Although you could probably argue that incels are the closest we've ever got to that. But they will base their theories on experiments from the modern day on people who have already been shaped by modern societal stimuli. So all the Manosphere can do to back up its claims is use its shaky pop evo psych and statistics and survey data from the modern world. And they have attempted to do this with flaws. Many flaws. No, I don't 
one no scrub A scrub is a guy with no one-to-one -one ratio on his splanchal cranium I wanna chat to breed for the alpha seed Not the beta needs Don't holler at me or I'll puke Citation needed First of all, let me take you through the entire theory of the red pill Fasten your seatbelts! So back in the 50s, most women were happy housewives who didn't bother themselves with man things like joining the workforce and stayed at home to care for the children. But in the 60s, the contraceptive pill led to the sexual revolution. This meant that due to the decreased pregnancy risk involved in casual sex, people did not get married as young, but this also caused an increase in accidental pregnancies out of wedlock, causing an uptick in single motherhood. Single mothers are not capable of raising a child properly on their own, causing the children to become criminals and join gangs in order to replace the missing masculinity present in their childhood. <sighs> Bear with me. Over the next few decades, the feminism movement has also allowed women to enter the workforce, which is actually against their own wishes, even though they don't realise this. Due to their biological ticking time bomb, they actually prefer to be using their most fertile years to bear children, and when their careers force them to miss out on this, they become depressed. Insanidate me now! Hypergamy is the ingrained female nature to date up into terms of status in order to ensure stability for our offspring. This is something that we cannot shake. It's programmed into us. It is causing young and fertile women to only select the bad boys or the alphas, leaving all of the young betas without any sex, as the top 20% of chads sleep with the top 80% of women, leaving 80% of men fighting over the bottom 20% of women. This is a Pareto principle in the dating marketplace. So once women have had all of their fun and hit the wall at around age 30, 30, meaning too many other young women have entered the sexual marketplace for her to compete with for all the sexy alphas, she will find a wealthy, beta nice guy to settle down with so he can provide her with the children and the stability. The most sneaky females though will get pregnant by an alpha and then get her beta to provide for the child. But women joining the workforce and the ingrained hypergamous nature of women means that the pool of men that they will willingly date is becoming smaller and smaller as the woman earns more herself the man must still earn more than her so due to this an increasing number of men are not seen as husband material and are left single and alone therefore we must revert back to the societal norms of the nuclear family where both men and women are happiest getting married at a young age to someone of similar status will ensure that there's always a woman available for a young little beta cook to marry. But the men who want to thrive in the current dating market must become an alpha and make a lot of money due to this hypergamy thing. And you must join my course to learn how. Only 997 down to 99... Today we're going to be talking about hypergamy. Five forms of female hypergamy. You know the word hypergamy or hypergamy, however you want to. On this podcast... We don't cry about hypergamy. So hypergamy. This is a huge subject. Human females engage in hypergamy. Women mate across and up dominance hierarchy. With a small percentage of men hogging a large percentage of women. Women can't get rid of their hypergamous nature and then just leave the men at the bottom to be cast away. That's fucking terrifying. It's widely accepted that women are, are hypergamous. That's it. First of all, let's look at the supposed evidence that they have for hypergamy. This is a study which revealed that 5,000 years ago, after the rise of agriculture, a huge uptick in wealth disparity meant that there were a small group of very rich alpha males that reproduced with, on average, 17 women, cooking the rest of men into sexless oblivion. To deal with this, we developed the monogamous system which ensured no man was left out of the reproductive sexual marketplace. This was an example of women's ingrained hypergamous nature at its peak. And if we allow the current sexual marketplace to expand to its natural conclusion, it will all happen once again. You know, they were, they were the incels of, of thousands of years ago. Yeah. They were the original, right? So they, they might group up to rebel against 
the Chad, and they will take the women and separate them among themselves. The, the Marxists, for example, they came to America and they destroyed thousands of years of cultural evolution. We live in a primitive sexual market. Yeah. Just like it existed thousands of years ago. For a start, there is no consideration that this may have not been the women's choice. Many of these powerful alphas were probably R-wording the women in all reality and not allowing her any choice in her mating preference whatsoever. One of the things your research has indicated is that there, there is a manner in which women are attracted to people who manifest dark triad traits. Yeah, I would say, I would add the qualifier that it tends to be younger women, teenagers or women in their early 20s. There is no modern day evidence that women prefer bad boys, either when they're ovulating or when they're not. There's actually more evidence to prove the opposite. There is evidence that women are attracted to men with dark triad traits, but one of these traits is narcissism, which correlates with physical attractiveness and extroversion. And in much the same way, men are attracted to women with dark triad traits as narcissism correlates with physical attractiveness. So once the physical attractiveness and the confidence is controlled for, dark triad traits actually add nothing for either gender. Basically, you can be confident and nice and you'll still be attractive to women and men. But this doesn't stop JP stomping around podcasts, talking about this like it's science-based fact. The only other evidence they have for this is the pop evo psych evidence, which has not been proven to the point of peer-reviewed consensus. Peterson will maintain that cross-culturally, women have always dated across and up. Females engage in hypergamy, and hypergamy is the, and this is also true cross-culturally, and it's also quite uh, it's just as extensive in Scandinavia. Not quite, there's a bit of attenuation, but not much. Women mate across and up dominance hierarchies. Men mate across and down. Okay, well, and that has to be the case, because <laughs> obviously it has to work that way. If one goes up, the other has to go down. This is only half true. Peterson consistently fails to point out the hordes of studies that show that hypergamy is much less prominent in more developed countries because as an economy develops and is able to provide social safety nets and less children die at a young age, they will have less children at an older age as it is safer to do so and they will choose a spouse later in life based on other needs, such as emotional needs. You're probably not familiar with this concept, Jordan, but people are finding other people that actually like them. So I don't know, this kind of sounds like a much better solution for all genders rather than trapping people into marriages they entered for the needs of bearing children and economic stability. But that's apparently the red pill utopia that we're all striving for. Peterson and his incel minions also don't account for the fact that men, on average, thanks to millennia of patriarchy, earn more than women still. So it's not surprising that we're still living with the norms of a husband earning more than a wife. Divorce rates are actually lower than ever because marriage rates are lower than ever because people are actually waiting to find someone they actually fucking like later in life after their frontal lobes are fully formed. And this is actually decreasing the chances of younger, less wealthy men being left with nobody and of old female spinsters being left with nobody. But hang on a minute, say the incels, there is evidence that women are initiating divorces when they get promoted. This means they're looking for higher status men. We tell guys all the time that marriage isn't really a good institution in the United States anymore. A woman choosing a bartender who is broke over a rich guy is just so far removed from reality. The concept is known as monkey branching. 70% of all marriages end because the woman petitioned to have it in. it's yeah. set up so that the one with less money is the one who gets spousal support. Because they've been incentivized to do so because of the wealth transfer. For women, like the richest women in the world, either got their money through inheritance or they got it through divorce. Right? They just want to protect themselves. That's generally why they do a it. A woman breaks up in order to trade up. I could struggle with you or I could take this money that the government's giving me 
and all I got to do is sleep with you. Ultimately, this can also be her searching for a bigger, better option. And they believe they've got relationship equity that they can make a withdrawal on at a later date. Women do initiate more divorces now because when they feel that they can support themselves, they are less likely to trap themselves in an unhappy marriage in which they are expected to do most of the household chores, causing them stress. There is no evidence that they are leaving them for higher value males. There is also another apparently hard to swallow pill that women will cheat on their beta male husbands with alphas. Another theory that Peterson backs up with particular fervor. And I'm, I'm not saying anything for this or against this. This is a purely factual biological claim is they pick a monogamous marriage and they cheat with high status guys. Now, you know, obviously in the confines of the marriage, that's a terrible thing, but that's a very uncomfortable subject, though, <laughs> for women in particular. Oh, it's an uncomfortable subject for everyone. Right. Is there any evidence to back this up? Absolutely not. From survey data, men admit to cheating on their spouses more than women, but the women are catching up with the men because the most common way for someone to cheat is with someone they know, like a work colleague. So now women have been allowed to leave the house more, they're actually beginning to cheat as much as men do, but there's no evidence that they've ever cheated more than men. And it's still not the norm to cheat either, like it's somehow become socially acceptable. There's no societal shift away from monogamy. We still want to get married or settle in long-term relationships. Humans pair bond, that's what we mostly do. We're just doing it later when we're settled in life. Furthermore, there is no survey data that shows that the women who do cheat are doing so with high status men. If we're going to talk about this through a pop evo psych lens, surely it's more evolutionary advantageous for a woman not to be hypergamous and to be wary of the risk of getting involved with the wrong man who will not support her child. Since the woman has always been the more selective gender, she's always had a choice between a beta or an alpha, so why would she willingly put herself in the dangers of an aggressive, violent alpha and leave her children without a father? Why not just settle down with the beta from day one who will protect her from all of the preying alphas? These red pill men are simply projecting how they see the dating market onto women when women actually see it very differently. Take it from me, if a man walks up to me and asks me for my number or asks me on a date, I'm not thinking, oh wow, I wonder if he has a nice car. I wonder if it's more expensive than my current boyfriend's. I'm thinking, I hope this interaction ends without this man getting angry, violent, or following me home. By getting involved with the red pill and by learning game, you're literally giving yourself a 101 on how to give women every red flag in the fucking book. But by far the most tangible evidence the Manosphere has for modern day hypergamy is from dating apps. Yeah, that's it. Data from dating apps. And this doesn't account for, you know, the plenty of fish data, the Tinder data that we have. Men do not get nearly as many options as women. And even if we're talking about top tier guys, they still cannot compete. In a since deleted 2009 official blog post on okay Cupid's showed women rating men as worse looking than medium 80% of the time. Most of the men on Tinder, of the profiles they come across, females, they'll swipe right on 60% of them. When it comes to females, they'll only swipe right on 4.5%. But the reality is guys, you look at OkCupid's data yeah. and they behave a certain way. On certain Tinder, uh, yes. women are, they they like, you know, swipe right. They like the profiles of only 4%. Men, when they see female profiles, they swipe right or like uh, more than 60%. That's a great example of hypergamy. Time to get debunked again, bitch. You like this? Being thoroughly debunked by a vagina haver with a second class degree in music production? There was one infamous blog post made by OKCupid in 2009, which supposedly exposed the hypergamous nature of women. It showed that women rated 80% of men on the website as below average in attractiveness, whereas men's ratings for women's attractiveness resemble more of an equalized bell curve. They jumped on this as proof of their Pareto 
principle. It's generally believed that this is one of the main catalysts of the modern incel movement and the blog post was eventually taken down not long after the incel attack in Toronto where 11 people died. The incels took this to mean that big tech was trying to hide the truth of hypergamy. Ironically, that same blog post actually showed that women are more likely to be open to messaging men they see as less attractive, whereas men are more likely to only message women they rate as more attractive to themselves. So it showed that even though women rate most men as below average, they are much more likely to message them anyway. So here we are again with the incel projection of shallow dating preferences on women. In addition to this, r slash Tinder data generally tends to show that men will swipe right on most women and women will be very picky and the ones that they do swipe right on will very likely result in a match. I need to explain why this is the case. A fact that the red pill seems to gloss over is that women are always going to be more picky than men when it comes to dating due to the increased risk of violence and pregnancy, not because of hypergamy. Let's have a look at some stats that the manosphere completely ignores. Younger women who have used dating sites or apps are especially likely to report having negative interactions with others on these platforms. A majority of female online daters younger than 50 say harassment, unsolicited explicit messages are very common on dating platforms. 60% of female users aged 18 to 34 say someone on a dating site or app continue to contact them after they said they were not interested, while a similar share, 57%, report being sent a sexually explicit message or image that they didn't ask for. Roughly half of women think dating on sites or apps are an unsafe way to meet people. More under 20s sexually assaulted after meeting offenders on dating sites. The victims in 83% of the 671 cases were female and 17% were male. Oh, and I'm not done yet. Here's a full report from ABC about Tinder's failure to act on SA reports. Of the 48 people they found who reported SA to the app, only 11 even got a response from Tinder. Almost all of those responses did not detail whether any action was taken, and Match Group, the company that owns basically everything, Tinder, OkCupid, Match.com, Hinge, Plenty of Fish and some others, has openly admitted that they do not screen for sexual predators on their free apps. A spokesperson said, there are definitely registered sex offenders on our free products. Which is a bit like a spokesperson for an ice cream company saying, there are definitely flesh-eating spiders in some tubs of our ice cream. Don't blame me, I just work here. So look at you, ladies. While Tinder makes men pay for the slight hope of more matches, you'll have to pay for the assurance that you won't be assaulted. And even then, it's not guaranteed. I cannot stress this enough. Dating apps do not represent real life. Dating apps represent an extremely shallow, gamified version of dating that artificially creates the Pareto Principle. Since women are more likely to have had previous negative experiences with men, I'm not discounting that men have them too, but the fact that women have them more often than men is relevant here. So women are more likely to have their guards up when swiping and chatting, so this causes men to get less matches on the ladies that they're swiping right on and the men are getting annoyed that they're getting less matches because this leads to less of a chance that they'll find someone that they like. To them, this just becomes a numbers game, so they start swiping right on more and more and more women, and the women start to realise that whoever they swipe right on, they're quite likely to get a match with them. And because they don't want too many unsolicited pictures of male genitalia taken with a pissy toilet bowl in the background to deal with, they start being more picky, confident that this won't matter because they'll still get a lot of matches anyway. As the women get more picky, the men get less and less picky. It's a negative feedback loop. It's not real life. Another stat that Red Pill seems to ignore 80% of users on Tinder are male and 20% are female. The bad experiences are causing women to leave the apps altogether. This means that there are women out there, guess what, in real life, who are single and want to meet somebody, 
not on a dating app. From the incel perspective, women are hypergamous, calculating and uncaring as they leverage emerging technology in the pursuit of the ideal masculine partner while maximizing the resources they yield from orbiters. Women are also simultaneously sexual commodities, which can be quantitatively evaluated, subject to market distortions or be unfairly distributed. Here, incels doubly deny women their humanity as women are manipulative when acting and overpriced when objectified. While incels' observations are accurate, their explanations for these observations are grounded in a reductive and dehumanizing descriptions of both men and women. All of a sudden, communism doesn't sound so bad to these guys when it means the equal distribution of getting your dick wet. Another graph that they love to point to is this one, which shows that almost a third of men are now reporting no sex in the last year. But zooming out and looking at the rest of this data that this graph comes from, it shows that the amount of men sleeping with over three women in the last year is still more than the amount of women doing the same. On the whole, men are still being more promiscuous than women, which doesn't track with their 80% of women sleeping with all of the chads theory. The data would suggest to me that women still want relationships with men, but men are increasingly attempting to leverage the dating apps for hookups, but are ending up more lonely than they were before. In short, guys, gals, and NBs, try opening yourself up to experiences which will help you meet people in real life. Make friends with people of all genders more, talk to people even if you don't find them attractive, because who knows, they could even introduce you to other people you may end up being intimate partners with, or maybe you've just found a new friend. It's about self-improvement, exercising your social muscle, and fighting that inner goblin that just wants to stay inside playing Dark Souls. Is that what you kids are playing nowadays? <laughs> Go outside and touch me. The men entering the dating market now have never experienced it without dating apps being involved, and this is a problem. The prevalence of our culture in society makes this dating app's negative feedback loop even more pronounced, as women have their guards up constantly on the lookout for red flags, scaring them off the apps altogether. Here's one post on the r slash Tinder data subreddit that I found, where a young 22-year-old man posted about his experience in the dating marketplace. 22,339 right swipes resulted in no dates for him whatsoever, and this is similar to many graphs posted there for young men. He says that his dating app experience made me waste a lot of time and money, completely ruined the little self-esteem and confidence I had left about myself and my own body, made me lose any real hopes in ever getting a relationship, family, normal life in the future, greatly worsened both my anxiety and depression to new levels never experienced before, made me go back to having suicidal thoughts after years of therapy, and as a result of my deepened depression, it also gave me a cannabis addiction and made me gain 50 kilograms of body weight due to a lack of sleep and lack of energy, etc. All of this makes this man a perfect target for Tinder, who will goad him into signing up for Tinder Gold in the hopes of getting more matches, and for the red pill community. The dating apps and the red pill community are not making money out of finding you happiness and a relationship. The more sad and lonely you are, the more they've got you trapped. So why is our culture completely ignored by the red pill? Well, they don't think it exists at all. And this isn't a belief confined to the red pill itself. It's actually held by right-wing pundits everywhere. And on college campuses, they like to say, oh yeah, one in four women gets raped on college campuses. No, it's actually more like one in 2000. This genera generation Z is having the least amount of sex <laughs> of any other generation, but yeah. yet we live in a quote unquote hookup culture. Because right? we're using the female or else. One in three, one in four, one in five women are going to get sexually assaulted on campus, which is just nonsense. Which we both agree is the idea that rape is perpetuated, encouraged, or tolerated in a society you would need to present some kind of data. Because it's this idea of rape culture, it's the rape fantasy of, I don't know, third wave feminism, I don't know what it is. I don't believe rape culture exists, 
because people know that rape is bad. Some surveys were run to find the prevalence of SA on college campuses in the US not long before Obama and Biden were elected. One in five of every one of those young women who's dropped off for that first day of school before they finish school will be assaulted. The right claimed that this was not true, and they still believe that to this day, claiming that the real number is somewhere around 1 in 52 women. According to the Department of Justice, or Bureau of Justice, about 1 in 52 of all sex. That includes, you know, playing grab ass. Much more comprehensive data from the U.S. Bureau of Justice Statistics estimates that about 1 in 52.6 college women. There's a vast difference between 0.6% and 25%. To play devil's advocate for a second, the survey that found the original one in five number that the Obama campaign used were conducted across only two college campuses in the US. So they didn't really give a comprehensive view of college R culture as a whole across America. There is also no evidence to suggest that R culture is worse on college campuses than it is in general for people of any age, whether they're enrolled at a college or not. However, in 2015, the CDC conducted their own survey called the NISVS, which did not only ask students, but everybody whether they had been a victim of this type of crime. Its findings backed up the student survey, saying that one in five women had actually been awed. This contrasts with the numbers obtained by the Bureau of Justice and Statistics, and these are the numbers that the right-wing pundits use. So this number is based on the NCVS Crime and Victimization Survey, which states that around 1 in 52 people of all ages has been a victim of R or SA. For that reason, there's no way for me to compare the stats for college-age women from the BJS numbers versus the CDC numbers for the college-age women because there's no CDC survey that focused on just college women. So for that reason, I'm scrapping the college age part. We're just looking at everyone to keep this simple. So I'm going to compare the CDC's findings that one in five women have been awed and the BJS's findings that one in 52 women have been awed or SA'd. One talking point that they like to give us is that the CDC's definition for the crime is like far too wide and the BJS's definition for the crime is very precise and they were and the questions were extremely vague not direct like the definition that we gave you guys before as far as grape goes according to the fbi so first of all let's compare the definitions of the crimes so there's always going to be gray areas here as to what people define as crossing the line but Overall, these definitions between the surveys are more or less pretty similar, wouldn't you say? So how did the CDC find that 50% of women had been a victim of SA and one in five had been a victim of R, whereas the BGS found that one in 52 people had been a victim of either R or SA. It's down to how you conduct your survey. The stigma surrounding R culture prevents people from knowing they're a victim of R or SA and even willing to admit to themselves or others that they're a victim of R or SA, especially if it was perpetrated by a close friend or intimate partner, which is most cases. The CDC used trained staff to carry out the NISVS. This survey only asks respondents about R and SA, no other victimizations. They also did not use the words R or SA in their questions, but described events to the respondents whilst reminding them that the event, if it happened, is not their fault. They didn't even make the respondents say yes because that can trigger trauma. So instead they asked how many people have ever made you and listed certain acts so that the person could just say a number. The Bureau of Justice and Statistics used the NCVS to find the one in 52 number. So this is a generic crime victimization survey. The staff were not trained on how to speak to people about R and SA. Respondents of this crime survey had a screening question jumped on them about R and SA in the middle of other questions which asked whether they'd had their car broken into or their house broken into or been mugged. 
These screening questions also used the words are and essay, and if the respondent said no, then no further questions were asked. Furthermore, an entire report was written by a board of experts to explain a ton of other factors in the NCVS, which also lead to the underreporting of R and SA. These surveys also probably both still underreported because they only contacted household numbers, whilst not including places such as military bases, healthcare facilities, or domestic violence shelters. And it's also very unlikely that someone currently living with an abusive partner would sit there on the phone taking a survey about their abuse. But you want to know why they're you want to know why women continue to falsely accuse men of rape because they're not being prosecuted. In order to keep all men and employers fearful of false accusations of rape, domestic violence. We cannot believe the victims as soon as they come out because sadly that's what these women do. They falsely accuse people of rape and then when you call them out they get mad at you and a few days later they say yeah it was for clout. You, know, you can't completely dismiss this very real fear that men have that some evil woman could come along and just ruin their life with a in story. In this whole era of the Me Too movement, I think that we've done a huge disservice to everybody. Assuming that anytime anybody's accused of anything, that it must be true. There is currently no evidence that any women anywhere are getting any sort of benefits from accusing men of R or SA, whether it was false or not. What they're more often getting is harassment and setbacks in their careers, especially when it's a powerful man being accused. But how many of these accusations are false? Well, Rollo and other Manosphere influencers like to insinuate that these sneaky females are doing it all the time. So the thing is this, is that the definition basically says that any allegation of rape can only be classified as a false allegation if it has been determined after a thorough investigation that a crime did not occur. It's, it's, it's basically trying to prove the negative. So just because those fraudulent ones were the ones that they could record according to the definition of what it is does not mean that 98 to 98% are, are true, but that is exactly what a prosecuting attorney will try to convince a jury. It is true that we'll never accurately know, but there is an estimate of between two and 10%. And if it could be as many as one in 10, that could be a problem. Okay, so let's learn about false R allegations. To best determine whether an R allegation is false, police look at the nature of the allegation. Based on previous investigations where R's have been proven to be false or the accuser has retracted the allegation. Looking at these cases, the most common occurrence is a minor who has skipped school or missed a curfew and to avoid punishment they say that they've been assaulted. In the vast majority of these cases, the parent will file the report on behalf of the child. And when the child comes into the police station, it becomes clear that this was not a real event as they will not name or describe the perpetrator or the event. Other common motivations include people attempting to cover up unfaithfulness to their partner, anger or revenge, attention or sympathy. In these cases, when the allegation has served its purpose, it is normally retracted or dropped. Another large portion of them come from mentally ill people. These people will also very likely describe a violent attack, the type of R that we know is not actually that common. An R allegation is unlikely to be false if the victim describes a situation that involves someone that they know, an intimate partner or a friend as the perpetrator, and the issue of consent could be construed as a grey area. But of course, we don't know. Some of the allegations counted as true could be false, but just as much some of the allegations counted as false could be true. But this doesn't mean that police are throwing men in jail based on the assumption that an allegation is true based on the nature of it. You still have to prove it beyond reasonable doubt, which for R is incredibly difficult. 
Out of 216 complaints that were classified as false, only 126 had even gotten to the stage where the accuser lodged a formal complaint. Only 39 complainants named a suspect, only 6 cases led to an arrest, and only 2 led to charges being brought before they were ultimately deemed false. Here, as elsewhere, it has to be assumed that some unknown percentage of the cases classified as false actually involved real R's. What they don't involve is countless innocent men's lives being ruined. According to the National Registry of Exonerations, since records began in 1989, in the US there are only 52 cases where men convicted of S, A or R were exonerated because it turned out that they were falsely accused. By way of comparison, in the same period, there are 790 cases in which people were exonerated for murder. In the average case of a false R complaint, the charges will be dropped and the man accused, if there even is one, will never even know about it. You are far more likely to be a victim of R or SA as a man than be falsely accused of it. You're also far less likely to report it or tell anyone about it. This includes domestic violence as well. If the Manosphere really cared about the well-being of men, that's what they'd be talking about. But it's not masculine to be a victim of DV, R or SA. You know, when my mother's generation became single mothers, at least they still had some shame. As about. we know, single mothers raise the worst children in America. That's a fact. Go look it up. Number one, a woman can't raise children by herself. I don't care what you guys say. If you look at statistics... And that's often what fathers, boys do in particular. They, they, they go into gangs mm -hmm. and they generate the missing man masculinity in the gang. 80 percent of black males who are in jail come from single mother homes. I've never ever met a single mother who actually puts her kids first. Single fathers raise better children than single mothers. Sorry, not sorry. Yeah. That's yeah. statistic and, reality. And I, guys do not date single mothers. Single mothers are the ones who are disproportionately raising the thugs who are doing this violent crime. The studies back up the point that most criminals hail from single mother homes, but the studies that they cite also point out that single mother homes are correlated with extreme poverty. Extreme poverty and being a single mother, surprise, surprise, is also correlated with stress and mental health issues. But ensuring that these single mothers have support through healthcare programs isn't the answer. No, of course not. That's socialism and we'll have none of that, please. We need a good masculine father figure in the home. Let's also ignore the fact that many single mothers from working class demographics break up with their child's father because they're abusive and are more likely to commit a violent crime and a lot of the time are in fact incarcerated. But no, this isn't a problem with poverty causing crime and violence, it's the absence of masculinity in figurative years. But just in case you were thinking for just one second that because of this they'd be pro-abortion, because surely we want fewer single mothers. That's why I said today abortion is all about hypergamy. Women get to decide who gets born and who dies. Let's also ignore the fact that the rise of the contraceptive pill actually reduced abortion rates to way lower than they were in the 80s. Let's also not mention that better education and funding for family planning services could prevent even more unwanted pregnancies. <sighs> but yes, giving women less control over who is born, but also ensuring that their lives are taken over by motherhood against their will and trapping her into relationships with potentially abusive husbands is the answer. Sounds like some good strong foundations to build the fabric of society upon. But wait, the women clearly aren't cut out for the workforce because of the gender pay gap. So the wage gap myth does not exist. It's, it's, it's a fallacy. It's been debunked a million times. Multivariate analysis of the pay gap indicate that it doesn't exist. You mentioned agreeableness. Agreeableness is a very big predicator on how much money you earn. The so-called wage gap is mostly, perhaps entirely, an artifact of the different choices men and women make. The wage gap is a the myth. The wage gap is a myth. Oh, women do not get paid less than men. It is illegal to pay two people that are doing the same job different. Now, the gender pay gap exists for many reasons. One reason 
is discrimination which has been proven with blind tests using CVs with male and female names causing the women to be offered on average $4,000 less as a starting salary and perceived to be less competent than men. But another reason is the tendency for women to be more agreeable. This is true but there is no hard evidence that shows that this is actually hardwired into women's nature. Navigating the workforce under a patriarchal regime tends to shift a person's personality to guarantee survival. Aggressive women, especially aggressive women of colour, are known to receive harsher consequences than men in the workplace. However, the manosphere likes to contend that this one factor of the wage gap, agreeableness, which is half within a woman's control, is the reason for 100% of the disparity. But this is far from the truth. But these mentioned factors are dwarfed by the main culprit, motherhood. When a woman becomes a mother, she falls behind in her career substantially. She will take more time off than the father to take care of the child, causing her to fall behind, work less hours and get paid less. Now you could argue that she chooses to do this because of her ingrained motherly nature, but if you take a look at Sweden for example, you could argue that they are the most advanced country in terms of gender equality. The government funds the same amount of leave for the mother and the father with a 90 day minimum for each parent and the remaining 150 days allocated however the parents themselves choose. But social norms expecting the mother to take more time off still persist causing them to do so. However the disparity of hours worked between men and women in Sweden is actually the smallest in the world. And how has this affected parents? Well, it has been found that men are actually more likely to persist in helping with the household chores throughout the rest of the marriage if they get in the habit of doing it during paternity leave. And men helping out with more of the household chores actually reduces the likelihood of both women and men to become depressed, leading to a healthy marriage. So what truly is choice in a society which expects you to act in a certain way? When your family members and your boss are looking at you and your husband and expecting you or even pressuring you to take more time off than your husband. Especially in countries where government funded paternal leave is far shorter than maternal leave or both are non-existent like the US. If the woman is already earning less than the man, it makes sense for the woman to take more unpaid time off. Okay, there's no gender pay gap. There's a mother gap. There's other reasons too, but women really take a hit when they become mothers. Okay, that's unfair. Fair enough, man. What the hell are you going to do about it? Well, an all-encompassing solution to this could be government-funded paternity leave equal to maternity leave and shifting societal norms towards expecting the father to raise the children and take on household chores as much as the mother. For a public intellectual, this man is incredibly easy to debunk. I'm a fucking bimbo with an internet connection. But, aha, the incels have got us again. They've got studies which prove that women are unhappier than they've ever been since the 70s. And what's to blame? Get your red pill bingo cards out. You must be getting good at this by now. <laughs> yep, it's feminism. After women have hit the wall in their 30s, they apparently become depressed because they have not yet fulfilled their ingrained need to procreate, inseminate me, fertilize my eggs, I need to create life. We know <clears throat> that female life approval ratings have went down as feminism has gotten stronger. Studies have shown that ever since feminism and equal rights, women are unhappier. According to the scientific research, women are unhappier and more self-conscious than they've ever been. And so women are much unhappier. Freedom and happiness, those are not the same thing. They're not even close. They have no idea how to have a job slash career and a family. So, and there's no answer to that. It's a really difficult problem. No. There is no evidence to support that this is the reason for women's unhappiness. 
if we take a wider look at the data, everyone's actually way less happy than they were in the 70s. That's why I dress like this. It's cope. But women's happiness has declined a little faster than men's. It has been hypothesized that women's happiness was artificially high in the 70s because we were optimistic about the feminism movement. But then we slowly realized over the subsequent decades how much systemic fuckery we'd have to deal with. The main cause of unhappiness in women is stress due to expectations to take on most of the household chores, even though she's now joined the workforce. In addition to that, we're now comparing ourselves with men in the workplace and we're often treated differently. So while men's happiness has been declining, probably due to late stage capitalism, women's is declining a little faster due to the compounded issues. So we overtook you on one thing. We broke the glass ceiling of sadness, bitch. Suck my labia. What do you want? But the incel Pied Piper's solution for all of this is what he has called enforced monogamy, a regression into the societal pressures that caused women and men to get married at a younger age, therefore not allowing sneaky women to be constantly on the lookout for a higher value male and not pushing them into workplaces that they clearly don't want to be in. But why is enforced monogamy the solution for people that are involuntary celibates? Well, it's the solution to the it's the solution to the relationship between men and women. He was quick to point out or damage control by saying that he didn't mean literally state enforced monogamy, handmaid's tale style, but rather culturally enforced monogamy. Enforced monogamy meaning the people around you try to guide them in a way that you think is going to lead yes, to it's, a it's, harmonious it's, family. Yes, life. it's built deep into the cultural norms and if that starts to destabilize then there's trouble. Which I would argue is still the norm anyway, just at an older age. But it was too late. The little gremlins had taken the idea of a Gilead utopia to heart. You talked to Jordan Peterson? Overall, he is a, a, a intelligent man. Yes. Overall, he's a very moral man, I would say as well. He talked about a concept that was called enforced monogamy. And enforced monogamy is basically a concept of, as it sounds, enforcing monogamy. This is all just a common reactionary trope pointing out the growing pains of a social movement in progress and using these as proof that the social movement is wrong and should be reversed. They point out the problems in a movement that they themselves cause and use those problems to insist that it's wrong. It's a long fight, but it's one worth fighting. But once these incels have been in these communities long enough to give themselves a GCSE in woman hating, you can be sure the Dunning-Kruger effect takes place soon enough. And these men think that they know women inside out, especially inside. What's a roasty? A labia that looks like roast beef flaps because it's been destroyed by many chads. Since all females slutted up with a chad, they're all disgusting and roasty. Fun fact, nurses take the baby away from the mother for the first 12 to 24 hours because the female's natural instinct is to kill the baby so that they can avoid taking responsibility and they can go back to Chad slash Tyrone. It's called post-mortem distress birthing. If you were revamping the human body and we had to give boobs an actual useful function instead of just sex appeal, what could you have them do? If a woman trains and maintains the muscles in her p then she can even pick up a pencil with her p from just having control of the muscles in her p LOL. And when a woman has some control over her p muscles, can fool any man with regards to her faithfulness to it. You do not want to know how I wrote the script for this video. We're talking about genitalia here. Women nowadays ravage their precious part with tools and shit, stretching it out, prolapsing it. No wonder half of them on here complain about sizes. They're creating holes big enough to trap 50 Pinoy miners. Why do women even need gynecologists? It's just another excuse for women to pretend they're peevers, have so many problems, and get the gender-oriented pity party they crave. In reality, it's little more than a peevers social visit and a puff of perfume. Let's face it, 
if women's keywords really did have enough problems to warrant going to a doctor, then that's because they can't keep their legs closed and use them too much to manipulate men. This is why I'm MGTOW. What did she do this time? She used the kitchen roll to wipe again. Well, she has been on a budget this month. Yeah, yeah, you are oppressed, yeah. And it isn't restricted to female anatomy. There are also many, many theories flying around about semen retention, even though there's very, very little science to back any of this up. But that doesn't stop them. Despite being the most technologically advanced society that we know of, there are 130 suicides every day. Various other illnesses and negative events in the world can also be traced back to people who have chosen to waste their vital fluid as often as they felt like. Mein Führer, ich kann nicht zulassen, dass die Soldaten, die für Sie verbrechen. The male fruit flies expend lots of their resources, energy and time in pursuit of virgin female fruit flies. As a result, they have less energy for self-maintenance and growth slash development. The trade-off is the benefit of sexual success and the cost of a shorter lifespan. I suspect that this ecological principle of trade-offs is not much different with humans. Ah, uh, we love a manosphere king who frantically searches for that one animal which carries out social principles we personally wish society lived by. I'm a big fan of the social hierarchy of the praying mantis. Eating her mate gives the female extra protein to lay more eggs. So the male's loss is his offspring's gain. It's a kind of happy ending after all. I suspect that this ecological principle of trade-offs is not much different with humans. It's funny to laugh at the incels. They're all just, it's all just a bit of fun. They're all just harmless, aren't they? There is no ideology that does a better job at recruiting new foot soldiers than the alt-right. There are a lot of young white men struggling under the late stage capitalism who are simultaneously being told that they're privileged and live in the best country in the world and living the American dream in a nation whose advertising campaign is textbook masculinity. No wonder they're confused. For white men, it seems that the most common way into the alt-right is to begin blaming your issues on immigrants, and it escalates from there. However, it seems that if you're a young male of colour struggling even harder due to systemic racism, you're more likely to be funneled in via a hate of women. This would explain the wide range of ethnicities within the incel community, so much so that they've sort of sorted themselves into categories in order to begin being racist towards themselves, holding the genuine belief that all women reject them because of their race. Asian people are more uh, neonatal in how they look. So women tend to not be attracted to those facial features in general. So women tend to not be attracted to those facial features in general. They call themselves, among other names, black cells, curry cells and rice cells. And it is often white blonde women who are seen as the ultimate Stacy. Every single spoiled, stuck up, blonde slut. Black Manosphere influencers will follow this unfounded junk race science in order to identify with the rest of the Manosphere. Kevin Samuels, may he rest in p was one of the most prominent proponents of this. So what would you rate yourself on a scale from one to 10? You can't use seven. I would say a nine. This is where it becomes a difference of your opinion. And I do yeah. this in real no. life as an image professional. Well, then I would say I'm a seven, but then you say don't count a seven then. So that makes you a what? A six, but that's yes. a hard metric right there. But Well, that's yeah. the truth. I wanted to be ranked. Uh, where would you rate yourself? I would say an eight. Okay. 28 you're, and your dress size six? Yes, sir. And how much did you weigh the last time you weighed yourself? I was 160. 160? Yeah. At 5'7? So mm -hmm. if you're 5'7 and 160, you weigh more than the average man your size. How do you think that it, how do you think that affects your perceived SMV? Weight affects you by dropping you. Every 10 pounds drops you a point. Marriage and market is extremely competitive. You need to get your weight down to 
about 130. Is that your okay. natural hair? No, sir. Your hair, you know, when you work out, you sweat so much. Oh, that's bullshit. That's bull crap. Oh, that, that, is a bull, that is a bull crap black girl argument. His YouTube channel thrived from telling mostly black women that they are less attractive than their hypergamous nature makes them think they are. We talk about white women. Your image is beneath them. White women do it too. You ain't on that level. You don't have that. Oh, I wasn't supposed to say that. Beauty is not subject. That's why we have the golden ratio, the Fibonacci right. equation. Right. You can map their facial structure and it, it goes to a mathematical calculation. And the yep. thing is, we're talking about black women. They are on the opposite end of the spectrum on all ranks. How much would you say you uh, you spent with uh, Mr. Kevin Samuels? Guesstimate, I would say probably in between uh, upwards of $10,000. $10,000? Upwards of, yeah. Wow. Black women who find it hard to find a husband have their problems exacerbated by people's preferences to date within their own race and there being less black men to go around because they're five times more likely to be incarcerated in the US. This can make them insecure and lonely and come to Kevin Samuels for advice. A cat's called man's best friend? No. Meow, 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 What's called man's best friend? A dog. Right. Kevin Samuels was not the only one playing into this. Every problem I ever had came from the black woman because I believed in them and they came up short. Black yeah. women have the lowest approval rate of all the other um, races of women. I'm gonna say that again. Fresh and Fit constantly pedal racist vitriol against black women and sometimes black men. Probably how we met his wife. Wow, and then she looked back at like, look at this. Bro, if you wanna date a bunch of Shaniquas, go for it, man. LaQuisha. Uh, yeah, like uh, me and Fresh aren't really down with the brown nah, like that. Man. We ain't night Riders. I don't really date black girls. <laughs> <laughs> it's not because like, no, no, like, like most black girls are like Snick. annoying. How to put this, uh, ratchet, and they don't know how to like be Very reserved. Different. If we hated black women, would we bring African Mar American women and black women on the show? Okay, but the, 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 the question. Let, let, let me finish. There was even an incident where they goaded a black woman into getting very drunk on the podcast, something that they often do. I'm so drunk right now. And Myron, looking for a good bit of content, decides to antagonize her further and further about how much money he thinks that she makes. Okay, cool. We're not gonna have this debate. We're not gonna have this debate. Yeah, like, this. You're the one trespassing, looking stupid on camera. Okay, by Florida law, your invitation is officially retracted. If I wanted to, I could physically grab you and throw you out of here. But I'm not gonna do that. Like, literally, you're, you're a clown. You're gonna look stupid. Until she snaps and stamps on his foot. Yeah. Yeah, so she stepped on my foot. She did it. Oh, what? And what do they say to the camera immediately afterwards? Why is it always the black chicks, bro? It's always. When we sat down at our table, I saw a young couple sitting a few tables down the row. The sight of them enraged me to no end, especially because it was a dark-skinned Mexican guy dating a hot blonde white girl. How could an ugly Asian attract the attention of a white girl while a beautiful Eurasian like myself never had any attention from them? I thought with rage. When you're an influencer operating on the precipice of the alt-right, say you run a YouTube channel, you have to fool new recruits into thinking that you're just making edgy jokes. So let me get this straight. You grew up in a Muslim household and you're not covering your hair and your boobs are out right now? Well, again, I was <laughs> Hey, you guys. <laughs> it was a very um, open-minded household. <laughs> the honor killings will commence. <sighs> like, just meeting you for the first time, like, yeah, like, I hate women. Nah. And I, I, I get it. I hate women, too, bro. Like, it, it builds up. It's not really your fault, bro. <laughs> a woman's orgasm is useless. That's why a lot of societies, they cut women's clitoris so out. Right? It's useless. And as you would expect, in the manosphere, this edgy discourse often devolves into... R jokes. RSD, the now defunct PUA company, once run by Owen Cook and Julian Blanc, would make jokes about one of their coaches driving around an 
our van. There were once countless videos evidencing RSD's coaches' assaults on women, which have all been meticulously scrubbed from the internet, as Owen and Julian attempt to rebuild their brand as a more clean-cut lifestyle coaches. Owen Cook went through a breakup that he dealt with so well that he decided to give himself an entire new persona based on a movie character. He then bragged about a violent essay to a group of men caught on video which has since been wiped off the internet. I won't read what he said because it's disgusting, but it can be seen in this article if you really are interested. Together, they started the largest PUA company in the world, but following some controversy surrounding violence towards women, they have since tried to wipe all evidence of this from the internet. Blanc's PhD in female attraction involves a disturbing fixation with physical violence. Blanc proudly posts photos across social media of him propositioning women into chokeholds using the hashtag choking girls around the world. In a video that has amassed over 50,000 views and since switched to private, he teaches men how to essay women in Japan. Just go through Tokyo, grab girls and yell Pikachu and put her head on your D. Blanc instructs his audience before showing footage of himself doing just that. Inspired by their leaders, their followers would talk among themselves on forums about their own R and SA conquests. As someone is indoctrinated into the cult of misogyny, it gets increasingly unclear whether these posts are just edgy humour. The humour gets particularly dark when these men start to call themselves R cells and start goading each other into committing a crime because it's almost guaranteed to go unpunished. Some of them will even convince themselves that this is what women actually truly secretly want and it's their job to show them. It seems to be a natural progression from the red pill idea that women want powerful, higher status men that treat them like their subordinate, compounded by the dehumanizing language used in the PUA community that reduces women to non-sentient robots that you simply have to program. Look for girls that have qualities that make them coachable and get those bad habits out of her. There is an acronym in the PUA community for absolutely everything, such as inflicting FTCs onto HB8 and using specific techniques like BHRR to surpass her UFEAs. But now Owen has rebranded his look to a bearded man with dog tags, cleavage and serial killer glasses and rebranded his grift trying to separate from the Tyler Durden persona that he created. Now he runs two YouTube channel where he sort of shouts at the camera for two hours trying to get vulnerable men to sign up for his free confidence course which will also make you really rich but it's not convincing enough to be able to get men to stay on his stream for more than a second unless he has a woman sat next to him in lingerie. He's clearly still aiming for the same demographic. The free tour of course is just a heavily pressured sales pitch to get people to pay as much as possible possibly can be squeezed out of them for the full course. Don't you just love it when audio files get corrupted? Let's try the last bit of this video again. And Julian, after announcing that he had transformed himself through meditations, training and an insane amount of deep inner work, has become a self-improvement speaker with a similar setup. They still sometimes work together, shaming young men into getting minimum wage jobs so that they can squeeze as much out of their pay packets as possible. If you can't afford it, there was a, a comment like, I can't afford it, then what are you doing watching this video? That actually means that you probably should find a way to get this. Because if, hey, if you're not making money right now, what are you doing? Everyone and their mom is begging for employees. Get a job, find a way. Another PUA, John Anthony Lifestyle, tries to get his followers to sign up for the John Anthony Lifestyle. The first rule of the John Anthony Lifestyle, I am assuming, is to get Thor's hammer tattooed on your bicep. Nothing more manly than getting a fictional male heartthrobs tool inked on your arm forever and then showing that off by wearing tank tops as often as possible while you use your platform to constantly bitch and whine about other men who who are actually selling the exact same product you are. You can pay $497 for his course. 
Here he is with some women he's filmed without their consent, so Lord only knows what else he's up to. His other course, the Leeds Machine, is $697. This is his guide to navigating women like an NPC dialogue tree. Women literally only want one thing, and that's being spoken to like she's Siri. This guy loves his flowcharts. His USP is that he used his hyper analytical skills and engineering background to develop the most efficient tried and tested dating system on the planet sure dude even the star of vh1's 90s show the pickup artist mystery was far from a well-adjusted alpha male a man who goes by only one name mystery he invented the concept of peacocking, which is dressing in bold statement clothing in order to strike up conversations with women. Even if this means dressing like your mum said, we've got JK from Jamiroquai at home. I ordered him from Wish. On the dark web. Or like you've just left the welding factory to go to your second job as Satan's toilet plunger, but your friend has a Monsters Inc. themed BDSM party. His protege, Neil Strauss, the man who wrote the game, said, mystery would threaten violence against women or their new boyfriends when they rejected him, sometimes against the woman's unborn fetus, or would threaten to video game himself. He has since had children but lost custody of them somehow in 2016. Neil Strauss himself now regards the industry as hateful and having left him with a debilitating sex addiction which he had to work through in order to settle down with his wife. Roosh V, the controversial PUA whose meetups were banned from the UK among other countries, advocated for the legalization of R on private property, a statement that he later walked back on and described as satire. He would market his courses as simple dating and pickup advice for lonely men, but once they were in the room with him, he'd yell about how much he hates women for an hour. Women are being applauded and encouraged to look like fat, outer space cyborgs. He wrote multiple books about how to game certain countries, which basically served as diaries of our confessions. He slowly unpeeled more layers of the alt-right onion, but soon realized that the alt-right did not consider Roosh to be a white man himself, so he wasn't entirely successful. So now he's had a spiritual awakening he took mushrooms and is highly ashamed of his past, believing that sex before marriage is all wrong. But he's still peddling anti-Semitic conspiracies and believes that the government and women are all controlled by Satan. Well, at least he's grown himself a nice beard and even thinks hugging is wrong now, so he won't be going anywhere near you ladies. If I am in a courtship with a woman, I will not give her a full body hug. I will not learn about the contours of her body. I will never get a whiff of her glandular scent. I will be blind to her flesh and ability to please my flesh. One Manosphere influencer, Donovan Sharp, who is on his third channel after having been removed from YouTube twice for hate speech, will reinforce the idea to his followers that women find violent men attractive. Men with criminal records get better treatment and hotter women than men without them. That's how it is. If you have a criminal record, a violent criminal record, or if you serve time in prison, women are more attracted to you. He will try and impress his followers by giving off the impression that he he himself had been arrested for violent crimes when they were, in fact, for fraud. He has even written a blog post before advocating for domestic violence because it makes a woman respect you. Dude, I'd have sucked her and I would have just decked her. Dude, I would have broke this this fucking face. This is the problem with women. Dude, that makes me want to break her fucking mouth open, dude. I probably would have hauled off and decked her. He's a better man than me. I'd have punched the bitch. I'd have been like, you what? Boop. Dude, I'd have cracked her right in her cheek. Dude, her cheek would have been the size of a fucking cantaloupe. Dude, I'd have dropped that hoe. I would have fucked her up in front of everybody. And none of this is helped by the insinuations of public intellectual Jordan Peterson. That underlying threat of physicality is always there, especially if it's a real conversation and it keeps the thing civilized to some degree, right? Like if, if we move beyond the boundaries of civil discourse, we know what the next step is. Okay, that's forbidden in, in discourse with women. And so I don't think that men can control crazy women. And what meaning do you think the manosphere takes from all of this? When a woman exposed Myron for telling her he will 
only have her on his podcast if she slept with him, a master of game and pickup right there, Myron managed to turn it around on her, contesting that she was in her feelings about his proposal and in turn his doting followers sent her abusive DMs and death threats. She was a single mother which made the vitriol ten times worse. When the apparently bulletproof PUA techniques marketed to lonely young men surprisingly don't work, many red pills will influence each other into becoming violent, some will join the PUA hate forums, become incels and may even go black pill and lose all hope and start posting sewer fuel to each other and start joking about attacking the chads and the Stacys in a day of retribution, which is exactly what Elliot Roger did. In an online forum in which you do not know people personally, or you cannot hear people's tone, it can come as a shock to some members of the community who all thought that this was just for the lulls. I left after the Toronto attack because I didn't want to be a part of a community that supports violence, even if it's in a joking way. All this has driven me to a point where I'm dating a man now. I have a boyfriend because I couldn't put up with women anymore. I couldn't put up with being cheated on by women and being lied to and betrayed. And so I've pretty much gone gay. Andrew Tate became the laughing stock of the manosphere until everyone all of a sudden realized that everything he was saying was actually true. He moved to Romania because of the lax SA laws there and bought a mansion in which they run their business. I refuse to make a joke out of this man. I don't care how many quirky things he said about sparkling water because all evidence, in my opinion, points to him being a dangerous sex trafficker who should be in jail. Tate made a joke out of the raid, uploading footage of it to his YouTube channel with alpha male pimp music over the top, which his fans ate it all up. Vice exposed a seduction artist, Justin Wayne, who would often videotape his conquests in the bedroom as proof that his techniques worked without the women's consent. He was caught on camera threatening his girlfriend with his weapons if she did not comply with his demands. Let, let, let just get this shit over me because I'm only here for the money. I'm not going to want to pay if it's like, if you embarrass me on camera. I can do anything I want. Like, get to remember, I'm always going to have more weapons and stuff like that, okay? Just don't fuck with me, please, okay? I'm, not, I'm going to lose it all. I'm crazy like that. I've always been crazy. That's why I put girls online and, and they, they for years and no one does anything to me. Listen to me. If you don't trust me, listen to 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 me, in your life. The discourse around the alt-right parade in Charlottesville was also focused around race, but some of the protesters were chanting white Sharia now, an expression of their desire to control women, to secure the white race by not allowing women to sleep with other races. Yet another joke that started out as a meme on 4chan. The female victim of that parade was then ridiculed online by the right. I thought she died of a heart attack. She was shocked by the seeing the car crash happening yeah. and had a heart attack. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a really sort of. I, I know, I know, it's, you know, it's horrible, it's, but it does seem like, a very dramatic reaction. It's, it's more than the old rice being blamed for someone having a heart attack. The Christchurch attack in New Zealand was accompanied by a manifesto starting with the words, it's the birth rates, it's the birth rates, it's the birth rates. His manifesto included theories about white replacement being caused by invaders impregnating white women, stating, weak men have created this situation and strong men are needed to fix it. And as Breivik's manifesto included the theory that women's greater erotic capital is causing the emasculation of men, creating a matriarchy that will be the downfall of the white race. Even while I was researching this video, America's worst attack in 10 years by a young male shooter happened, a young man who had shown signs of misogyny beforehand. And what were the right focused on? The left has been on a 50-year mission, really, to de-emphasize the importance of fathers in the home. And the results have been disastrous for all Americans, especially for young men in urban settings. A direct talking point from the Manosphere. Common victims of gun violence in the US are, in fact, 
women being shot by their husbands, men who have shown a history of domestic violence. A study was carried out in the UK to figure out the core causes of familial homicide. 90% of people who kill their whole families are male, and the overarching issue connecting these were men who were too heavily in a very stereotypical conception of what it means to be a husband and a father within an institution called a family. Their view of the family is very black and white and doesn't reflect the increasingly dynamic role that women can play in the economy and in the institution of the family itself. These men are still mostly seen as lone wolves and not as victims of the alt-right pipeline. On 4chan, Alec Manassian had posted, there will be a beta uprising tomorrow, I encourage others to follow suit. Incels will applaud other attackers as jokes until, of course, they are not. Jordan Peterson, of course, almost defended Manassian, saying that the cure for his anger would have been a society working to ensure he got married and backing up the popular incel theory that hypergamy was the reason for his loneliness. Men who carry out politically motivated attacks of any kind usually have a history of domestic violence, yet this connection between the attacks and the clear written evidence that this kind of violence against intimate partners is being applauded and even deemed necessary on alt-right forums seems to be completely ignored. Ignored. The rates of domestic violence are extremely vague because similarly to our culture, it's difficult to survey people on these issues due to shame and stigma. How many times has this violence happened in private to an intimate partner that was never reported to the police? Islamic extremism and white supremacy is well documented when it leads to violent attacks, but why not the misogyny as well? Conservative media is not helping and even making the misogyny seem normal. My investigation into Meghan Markle made me see that even though the media outlets supporting her would mention racism, there was almost no mention of the misogyny. The slut shaming of her and the expectation of her to be quiet and subservient to her husband was the most overt of the hate towards her and mostly came from other women. Misogynistic views are almost seen as entertainment and not serious. It's just content. With a reliance on outrage clicks, the more extreme a view you're platforming, the more eyeballs you'll get, even if the guest's views aren't that popular to the general audience. And I believe that feminists, when they present a choice to women between career and motherhood, it's a fake choice. It's not real because okay. they're pushing an agenda behind it to push them to delay motherhood. All you have to do if you're a right wing pundit is pretend you're anti-establishment while having your sleek studio funded by a sugar daddy billionaire and talk for three hours until your batshit ideas begin to sound plausible. That's not what modern intersectional third wave, as it's called, feminism is about, which seems to me, and I think to a lot of women too, primarily to be about man-hating. Um, it is a very angry, bitter, um, uh, profane, um, lesbianic sort of feminism. The Manosphere also loves these evolutionary psychologists that have fancy sounding qualifications such as Dr. David Buss. He hops around podcasts talking about his theories about the evolutionary reasons that women and men act the way they do in courtship. Women go for good genes, cues to good genes in the short term and cues to resources in the long term. Affairs are one way in which women divest themselves of a, uh, a cost-inflicting partner or a partner who uh, things aren't working out well with, and it's a way to either transition back into the mating market or to or to trade up in, in the mating market. And it appears as if it's based on scientific fact, but when you look into the research of this nature, it's often been debunked or the methodology is wildly flawed, but it doesn't matter to these guys. As long as they're getting funding for their research and getting publicity on podcasts because they're backing up think tank theories on what they think should be the way the female mind works, his career is in the bag. His only job is to keep backing up their world view with a scientific flair. I've not found one morsel of hard evidence for the differences between male and female behavior. There are physical, biological differences between hormones and brain structure, but no conclusions as to how these actually affect 
actions. Everything this man talks about is conjecture, based on his theories predicated on the shaky knowledge of how humans survived thousands of years ago. We even have a name for this, it's called a just so story, an untestable narrative explanation for a cultural practice, a biological trait, or behaviour of humans or other animals. It is impossible to test Dr David Buss's theories controlling for socialisation. That's what makes everything he says, in my opinion, a just so story. I think he has the right to speak of his theories in the context of them being a theory, but how he can go around speaking with such confidence of the evolutionary reasons women go for bad boys is beyond me, yet his academic prowess allows him to appear as if he's just speaking facts and logic. He is not. Guess what? He's speaking his feelings. The only subgroup of the manosphere that's purporting to work for actual progress for men's issues is the men's rights activists, but they repeatedly fail at actually getting anything done to help men because they relentlessly focus on blaming women and feminism. Has feminism gone too far. Feminism has, has, has always gone too far. Feminism today exists simply, well, for the reason it's always existed, to extend female privilege over men. There are, there are two national screening programs for cancer. More men die of prostate cancer than die of breast cancer. There's not even any discussion about there being a national screening program for men. Women have protection against genital mutilation. Males do. Males have no protection against uh, genital mutilation. Of course, he doesn't back up his original statement anyhow, instead listing a slew of issues which are important to men, but nothing to do with feminism. They focus on the difficult and dangerous jobs men do, but they will position that as an argument against feminism, as a sort of competition for who has it worse, rather than looking to the systemic issues that cause this. Men are encouraged to work dangerous jobs in a capitalist society that does the least amount that's legally possible to protect their safety. Any sane feminist would fight on your side to rectify these issues too. But what's the solution? It almost sounds like a joke to say we need to help cis straight white men. <laughs> But we do. I know, however, that by having a vagina, I'm probably not going to be a very convincing mouthpiece for these types of men. Plus, my video is probably not going to get thrown into an incel's YouTube recommendations, but I am aware that my audience is 80% male, and you're the guys that can help. I've shown you exactly how these people get indoctrinated, so perhaps you could help someone to see a manipulation tactic that's being used on them. It could be racist and misogynistic slurs masquerading as edgy jokes or manipulated statistics, or when they can't do that, they'll tend to focus on outlier cases such as the Duke lacrosse case. Keep a lookout for your male friends, co-workers and family members. Chat to them about deep stuff and try and make them see that their problems are valid. But the way out is to band together as a class of workers with different and nuanced issues stemming from the same oppressive economic system we've all found ourselves under, rather than a battle between who has a penis and who doesn't. I have provided some links to Men Against Sexism, Beyond Equality and the Men's Liberation subreddit in the description. In addition, I think the content creators on the left could probably give dating and relationship and sex advice a lot more often. It's something that we don't really talk about that much and when we're not even talking about it, where are they going to go? Anyway, here's me and my friends doing a song. <laughs>
beautiful people that you saw in that music video just then are my friends I mean <laughs> that's a push that's a stretch Quick. we're more than friends more especially than after that music video I mean let me tell you the amount of twerking that I endured I think we've enjoyed. established <laughs> I was having a breakdown I from laughing I so much. I was loving it. Because she was like, oh, look, should we film it again? Yeah. Oh, should we oh, get another take? Yeah. She's like, oh, Gory, it's the 70th yeah. take. Yeah. <laughs> Who's the better kisser out of me and Naomi? Me. I'm going to need some more evidence from both of you. Ooh, <laughs> baby! <laughs> <laughs> Them lips pursed up like an asshole when I approached. <laughs> <laughs> so we are the Roaster Girls, and we're starting a podcast. And you can watch it on the other channel that I'm setting up this podcast on that will be called Only The Roaster fans. Girls. Yeah. <laughs> no! Gory, do you want to... No! That will be called Only Fans when you Charlie met Georgie. <laughs> By using my download link in the description and using the code MOONCAT, you can get 83% off and three months extra for free. Once again, that's the code MOONCAT and you can get 83% off and three months extra for free.